Good afternoon, everybody. I've just chaired a meeting of the government's emergency COBRA committee following the sickening attack outside Liverpool Women's Hospital yesterday. My thoughts remain with all those affected. On, on behalf of the whole country, I want to pay tribute to the emergency services uh, who responded, as always, with such speed and professionalism. The police have now confirmed that this is being treated as a terrorist attack and while the investigation continues at pace, you will understand that I can't comment on the details of the case or its motivation, but it is a stark reminder of the need for us all to remain utterly vigilant and the independent Joint Terrorism Analysis Centre, JTAC, are today raising the UK's threat level from substantial to severe meaning an attack is highly likely. But what yesterday showed, above all, is that the British people will never be cowed by terrorism. We will never give in to those who seek to divide us with senseless acts of violence. And our freedoms and our way of life will always prevail. Turning to COVID, I want to update you on our progress, and in particular on the storm clouds that are gathering over parts of the continent. A new wave of COVID has steadily swept through Central Europe and is now affecting our nearest neighbours in Western Europe. Our friends on the continent have been forced to respond with various degrees of new restrictions from full lockdowns to lockdowns for the unvaccinated to restrictions on business opening hours, uh, restrictions on social gatherings. We don't yet know the extent to which this new wave will wash up on our shores, but history shows that we cannot afford to be complacent. Indeed, in recent days, there have been rising cases here in the UK, so we must remain vigilant, because there is one lesson we can draw from the current situation in Europe. Those countries with lower vaccination rates have tended to see bigger surges in infection and in turn been forced to respond with harsher measures, while those countries with higher vaccination rates have so far fared better. And this shows us once again that if we want to control the epidemic here in the UK and if we want to avoid new restrictions on our daily lives, we must all get vaccinated as soon as we are eligible. Today, following the recommendation of the independent Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation. We're making second jabs available to all 16 and 17 year olds from 12 weeks after their first dose. <clears throat> and we're making boosters available to all those aged 40 to 49 from six months after their second dose. Boosters, as you know, are already available for all those over 50, those with underlying health conditions and those working on the front line of our NHS and in care homes. And let me explain why that booster is absolutely crucial. Because over time, the protection from two jabs starts to wane. But that third jab boosts protection back up to over 90% against systematic infection. So far, around 12.6 million people across the UK have had that booster, including in England, around three quarters of all people over 70 and 80% of eligible older people in care homes. But many more people who are eligible have not yet come forward. And so, if you are one of those people, please go and get that third jab because it would be an utter tragedy if after everything we've been through, people who had done the right thing by getting double vaccinated, ended up becoming seriously ill or even losing their lives because they allowed their immunity to wane by not getting their booster. And if you haven't even had one dose, it's not too late. In fact, there's never been a better time to get that vital protection as we head into winter. So please, please go and get vaccinated to protect yourself and others. And in doing so, we can help to ensure that we can continue in the way that we are. Sticking to our plan of using vaccination to control 
this virus. Thank you very much. And I'm now going to hand to Chris to do the slides. Uh, thank you, Prime Minister. First slide, please. Um, the start, start off with some uh, relatively familiar slides uh, as an update to where we are. Uh, the number of people testing positive in the UK has uh, gone up and down a certain amount, but has been broadly been <coughs> flat at a fairly high level now uh, for uh, many weeks. And I think people can slightly overinterpret uh, slight downturns and slight upturns. Uh, the half-term effect is making it slightly more difficult also to interpret the most recent data. But broadly, this has been uh, flat at a fairly high level now for a while. Next slide, please. Uh, the number of people in uh, hospital with COVID uh, is mercifully a lot lower than it was in the peak, but it is still significant. And again, uh, this has been broadly flat for some weeks now. Uh, there's been a slight downturn uh, recently, but it is relatively modest. And I, I think I should reinforce a point which I'm sure everyone is aware of, that in all the other areas, the NHS is also under very significant pressure from uh, winter effects and from the catch up from COVID amongst other things. Next slide, please. The number of deaths of people who've had a positive test result for COVID in the UK uh, also are, again, broadly flat, currently averaging uh, around 156 deaths per day. Next slide, please. I wanted to uh, just pause a little bit on this one. This is the number of people aged 12 and over who receive vaccination for COVID-19 in the UK. And the overwhelming majority of people have chosen to take up that offer, protecting themselves and those around them. But I wanted to make two points to those just backing up what the Prime Minister has just said, who have not yet come forward for vaccination, strongly to encourage you to do so. The first is to the general uh, population. Uh, not only will you protect yourself, and you undoubtedly will at every age, you're better off being vaccinated than being unvaccinated you also protect those around you. And you do so by three methods. First of all, you are less likely to get COVID. And obviously, if you don't get it, you cannot pass it on. Secondly, if you do get it, you are less likely to transmit. And the third way is that if you get severe enough COVID to need hospitalisation uh, and you are unvaccinated, in, in all probability, that is the reason you're in hospital. Uh, and that bed could have been taken by someone else. So for three reasons, I would encourage people strongly who have not been vaccinated to do so. I would, and the second point I wanted to make on this, like to pull out in particular uh, the issue of women who are pregnant uh, or intending to get pregnant. And I would just like to give you some fairly stark facts about this because this is a major concern. Based on academic data uh, from the 1st of February through to the 30th of September, so aiming off because obviously early on in that period, people of this age were not being vaccinated. Uh, 1,714 pregnant women were admitted to hospital with COVID. Of those 1,681, which is say 98%, had not been vaccinated. And if you go to those who were very severely ill in intensive care, of 235 women admitted to ICU, 232 of them over 98% had not been vaccinated. These are preventable admissions to ICU, and there have been deaths. All the medical opinion is really clear that the benefits of vaccination far outweigh the risks in every area. This is a universal view among doctors and among the midwife advisory groups, and among the scientific advisory groups. So can I please encourage all women who are pregnant or wishing to become pregnant uh, to get their vaccination. And I would extend that also, incidentally, to flu, which is also very dangerous for women who are pregnant. Next slide, please. The number of people who received a booster or third uh, dose of vaccination is continuing to rise, uh, as you can see in this graph. And as the Prime Minister said, and my colleagues, uh, Professor Van Tam and Professor Lim and Dr. Rain said this morning, JCVI has advised and the government has agreed uh, to extend this, vaccine, this booster down the age the range to people in their 40s, as well as uh, to advise a second vaccine uh, for uh, young people uh, 16 and 17 years of, of age. Uh, and just to reinforce the points that were made earlier this morning, there is clear evidence that having a booster significantly increases your protection at all age ranges 
uh, and we, we would strongly recommend people who have actually uh, been invi invited to have the booster to do so, and given that we're heading into the very difficult winter period, to do so as soon as they are eligible to do so. Next slide, please. The final slide uh, was really just to put uh, some numbers behind the point that the Prime Minister made about the uh, rates uh, of increase in continental Europe at the moment. And I want to uh, put a caution around uh, comparing absolute rates because the way different countries measure this is different. So therefore, these are not strictly comparable. But the rate of change, because with any, any country it is stable, the rate of change can be interpreted. And as you can see, looking at there's already been a very significant increase in Eastern Europe which is still ongoing, with significant numbers of people dying, in particular among the unvaccinated. But that has now moved westward, and as you can see, is now increasing significantly also in many Western European countries. So uh, we all knew, everywhere in Europe we knew, that as we went into winter, into the typical respiratory virus flu season, that the risks would be greater. And I think this is a demonstration of the fact that uh, we're beginning to see a winter respiratory effect. Uh, there, there will be other reasons as well. So I think it is important that we take uh, COVID, con continue to take COVID extremely seriously and essentially continue to the, do the things that have been consistently recommended. Uh, vaccination, the boosters, including the new uh, areas, uh, but also uh, ventilation, wearing masks in, in enclosed spaces, washing hands, uh, uh, and taking sensible precautions, as people have done throughout this pandemic. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Patrick, anything to, to add? Let's go to questions from the public. Nigel from Hungerford. Uh, Nigel asks, with the current high levels of infection in school-aged children, what precautions should families take to avoid exposing older relatives to infection? Uh, Chris, why don't I ask you to... To, to take that one. Thanks, PM. I mean, I think that the, the biggest and most important things are obviously uh, to um, encourage the older members of the family to get their vaccination and get their boosters so that their immune system is in strong uh, position. And for those children who are eligible, uh, so that is the great majority of secondary school children, uh, to uh, get their, their first uh, vaccination when it's due and uh, for young people 16 and 17 to get their booster. That is really important. But then I think the sensible precautions that you would normally expect, which include, uh, particularly people are vulnerable, considering um, <coughs> trying to meet people where there's good ventilation, it's obviously more difficult in winter, but it is, a, it is practical in many situations, uh, and trying to encourage people to do sensible things, like if they have symptoms, uh, not to get too close to people who are older or vulnerable, including their own family members. Thanks very much. Uh, Michael from Staffordshire. Michael asks, in, in, hang on, he's gone, here he is again. Uh, increasingly foreign countries are demanding proof of booster COVID vaccination for entry to those countries and to, to public places. Why has the UK government not added the booster dose to the NHS COVID travel pass? Is the booster dose going to be added uh, to the NHS COVID travel pass and when? Um, Chris Patrick, I think that we will, we will be making uh, plans to add the booster dose to the uh, to the NHS COVID uh, travel pass. But again, I think what the, the general lesson is uh, from anybody who anybody who wants to travel, uh, you, you can see that uh, getting fully vaccinated uh, with a booster is going to be something that will, on the whole, make your life easier in all kinds of ways, including uh, for foreign travel. So I would, I would just say, you know, if you're thinking about about that, that this is yet another reason uh, to get it done. But anything to add on that? Thank you very much. Let's go to uh, Fergus Walsh of BBC News. Thank you, Prime Minister. Can you categorically rule out a Christmas lockdown? And how dependent is that on booster jabs? Thanks, Fergus. It's, uh, everybody has been asking this for, for some time now. And all I can do is, is humbly repeat the, uh, the mantra that we don't see anything in the, in the current data that leads us to think that we need to go to, to plan B, uh, which is, as you know, uh, several steps short of a, of a lockdown, but nonetheless would require uh, more restrictions. We don't see any, uh, any, anything in the data that says we have to go now to, to plan B. Um, but clearly we cannot rule 
anything out. And the most important thing people can do to prevent further uh, MPIs from being taken is to non-pharmaceutical interventions, that is, um, further restrictions, get the boosters. You know, it's going well. The numbers are climbing. 12.6 million is a, is a huge number to, to have hit. The GPs are, are hitting it out of the park again. They're doing an amazing job. The, 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 and they're getting loads of jabs into, into loads of arms. And we're now at 75% for uh, the over 70s, uh, more for, uh, for, for, the, for the over uh, 75 to 79 groups and, and for the over 80s. It's, it's, it's starting to build a lot of momentum. But we need to see those 50 plus groups and the 60 plus groups who can also wind up in hospital very, very easily uh, getting their booster as soon as as soon as you're called forward to get it. That's the best protection uh, we can have. Um, but you know, to repeat, I see nothing in the data at the moment that makes me think we have to go to to further measures. Uh, Emily Morgan of ITV. Hi, thank you Hello, very Emily. much. Um, the JCVI admitted to me earlier that there's still a really long way to go to encourage just eligible over 50s to have their booster. Are you really confident that uptake in the over 40s is going to be any higher than the over 50s and therefore have any significant impact on cases and infections this side of Christmas? Thanks very much, Emily. Well, the numbers are climbing. And it's it, it's good, it's good to see the way people are, are seeing the importance of this. I think in over uh, in over sixties, when I would uh, maybe fifty eight percent over over fifties, fifty four percent, and uh, as people are getting the call, they're they're starting to to come forward uh, with with greater speed, and the, the booking service is now really uh, being very very well used. That that's great to see. Um, the, it is vital that people over 50 come forward and do it, and I, I'm sure that they will. This country really, really pulled together to get the, the first vaccination campaign done. It was a, a, a fantastic effort by the public in coming forward, getting their jabs, and I'm sure that, uh, I'm sure that we can do it again. Yeah, can I just say, I see no evidence it's levelling off. No. This, is, this remains something which people want to get, uh, and there are long queues for people to actually get these, and, I, and that's a good thing. And you can see that in the numbers of, of the older groups that have gone up as the campaign has become more effective and as the convenience, and I think convenience is key here, yeah. to make sure it's easy for people to book and easy for them to get it. And I think we're going to see an increased uptake. I think it's the, the uh, that's right, I think it's the booking in advance uh, plus the the, uh, uh, the the greater number of centres of, uh, of help. Uh, Aisha Tull from Channel 4. Thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, do you think you've been too complacent on the rollout of the booster jabs with the closing of mass vaccination centres and also a lot of appointments are being cancelled? That's what people have been told us. Should the messaging have been clearer and stronger from earlier on? And just briefly on Belarus and Poland, do you agree with the head of the armed forces that the UK must be ready for war with Russia? Um, so first of all, uh, I, I saw on the, the vaccine booster rollout campaign, uh, the, the problem, uh, if there has been a problem, has really been one of, uh, of, of demand, not uh, not supply. We've been we've been ready to to distribute the the vaccinations, and it's taken some time to get them uh, to get them going. Uh, but the momentum is now very very much uh, with the campaign, and you can see people uh, coming forward with showing great great uh, public spirit, and and, and the, the mood in the vaccination centres that I visit in the GP surgeries is is very very positive and and. Uh, and, and and optimistic and and committed on um, Belarus and uh, and uh, and Russia, we are showing solidarity with our with our friends in uh, in Poland as, as as you would expect, and we would encourage uh, everyone to to work for for peace and stability in the whole uh, in the whole uh, European region. That's that's the position of the of the UK government. We, we stand shoulder to shoulder with our friends uh, across the, the whole region, uh, Estonia, uh, Poland, uh, we are there. Uh, ben Riley smith from The Telegraph. Thank you, Prime Minister. On COVID, one group we're not jabbing right now are children aged 5 to 11. If that's deemed safe for you back doing that, and to the scientists, are you advising Plan B? And if not, why not? And just one more topic, you have raised the threat level to severe. Can you tell the public anything about uh, the motivation of what happened in Liverpool and what would be your message to voters who might be worried right now? Um, yeah, uh, Ben, so on the, on the threat level, we're, we're moving from um, 
uh, substantial to severe on the advice of, of JTAC. I think that uh, that simply reflects the number of uh, of, a, of attacks that we've seen in the, or, or attacks failed or, or successful that we've seen in the last few weeks and months. Um, but the, if, if, as you know, it it that number, the, sorry, the, those gradations, substantial, severe, they they bump around. And um, what we're really saying to the public as a result of what happened in Liverpool is that they've got to be everybody's got to be vigilant. Um, that's I think what the, the message that JTAC is is trying to uh, to, to get over. And sorry, your first question was uh, yeah, Jack, so the five to twelves. Um, here, this is something that is being done in some other European countries. It's been done in the United States. Um, we will see what the uh, the JCVI has to say. But uh, Chris, Patrick, do you want to comment on that? I mean, just on that, I think it'll, you know we haven't yet even got a license with uh, MHRA, so I think let's not rush rush our fences on this. Uh, I think it'll depend entirely on the data that are presented to the independent regulator and the independent scientific advisory committee, uh, and on um, uh, advice. I mean, our the, the, our advice is to interpret the data as best we can for ministers, and they obviously make the final decision on what uh, should be done. But if you look at the data at the moment, uh, the numbers are broadly, as I said at the beginning, flat. So they're sometimes going slightly down, sometimes slightly up, but that's the number. Now, of course, underneath that, there is substantial pressure on the NHS, and that is widely recognised by everybody, ministers obviously included. Uh, but in terms of the COVID numbers, they're not currently going up in the kind of numbers you, you're seeing in continental Europe, but obviously if they did, that would be a situation where people, you know, have, people would have to look again at what the situation was at that stage. Nothing bad. Thanks very much. Uh, Richard Vaughan of the Eye. Um, I have a question which kind of touches on what Michael from Staffordshire said. Um, will the COVID rules have to change to better reflect the fact that people have boosters and now be classed as fully vaccinated? Does that mean if you want to travel as well as self-isolating domestically if you come into contact with someone with COVID. Will that also have to change in the future, in the coming months? Um, and uh, just on rail, um, new voters, uh, uh, sorry, new Tory voters in the north will find out this week that you've significantly pared back plans for um, uh, new rail links in the, in the north. Um, what's your message to them and why should they vote Tory again? Uh, thanks very much, Richard. The, 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 I just want to repeat what I said earlier on. on boosters it, it's it's very clear that getting th th three jabs getting your booster will become an important fact and uh it will make life easier for you in all sorts of ways and we will have to adjust our concept of what constitutes a full vaccination to take account of that and, uh, and i think that is uh, increasingly obvious the the booster massively increases your protection it takes it right back up to over over 90 percent and, and as, you, as we can see from what's happening, uh, the two jabs sadly do start to wane. So uh, we've got to be responsible and we've got to reflect that, uh, that fact in the way we, we measure what constitutes uh, full vaccination. And on the integrated rail plan, uh, which is going to be absolutely fantastic uh, for uh, the north, the northeast, the northwest, uh, Midlands, uh, all I can advise you and everybody else to do, uh, Richard, is wait and see when it is unveiled on, I think, Thursday. David Hughes of, uh, of PA. Um, Prime Minister, <clears throat> there have been a few incidents in recent weeks uh, at COP and on your visit to Hexham General Hospital uh, where you were pictured without a mask in settings where you might have been expected to wear one. Do you accept that by doing that, you are sending a message that might not be appreciated by the two gentlemen stood alongside you on the podium there? Uh, and um, for Professor Whitty, uh, we've seen a stark assessment from ambulance trusts today about the situation that they're facing. We know the NHS is under pressure, you yourself have mentioned it. It's only mid-November with a long winter ahead. How resilient is the NHS to even a small increase in the number of uh, COVID hospitalisations? Uh, yeah, so, so David, first of all, I wear a mask wherever the, the rules uh, say that I should, and I urge everybody else uh, to do the same. And, and people will actually have uh, seen me wearing uh, face coverings uh, uh, quite a bit more regularly recently as, as we've seen the, the numbers uh, ticking up in, in the UK. I think that's the responsible thing to do, and I'm going to, to, going to continue to do it. But what we're also going to do is we're going to continue uh, with our approach uh, which is uh, to rely on people's common sense, uh, to, on people's sense of 
personal responsibility to themselves and to others, but clearly uh, in confined spaces where you're meeting people that you don't normally meet, you should wear a face covering. And, and that's, that's, the, that's the advice we're, we're giving. Uh, on the second, I'm afraid the answer is that it, 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 you can't give a sort of uh, you know, simple answer. The answer is lots of different bits of the NHS are under different levels of pressure, some of them much less so, but some of them are sign under significant pressure, and clearly we haven't yet got to the point where the flu season would typically start. That's usually towards mid or end of December. So I think we've got a difficult winter ahead of us, as Professor Van Tam said this morning. I think that's a widely uh, accepted situation. Uh, the NHS is, is a remarkably resilient organisation. Nevertheless, everybody would accept that large parts of it, particularly at the moment the ambulance system, but there are others, uh, A&E and others, uh, are under very significant pressure and I'm afraid likely to remain so over the winter period, which is why all, all health staff would reiterate the point that PM has made about encouraging people to get vaccination. That's the single simplest thing people can do to help uh, reduce pressure over the rest of the winter period. Great. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I've got to go and give a statement. See you then.